Okay, this, I don't think this recording is going to be that long because uh, it's pretty self explanatory. You just, we are going to have to finish the revenge and forgiveness. Um, nobody re uh, presented on that. So everyone will be asked to present on that. People who are absent on Monday's class will be asked to present both their papers and their reactions to the article on the biology of the spirit. So um, the reading for today includes two more uh, interviews from Krista Tippett's book, and they're related to two pretty uh, popular, pretty issues that are discussed quite a bit, depression and stress. And the reason I have them at this point in the class is they're related to the personal virtues and vices. They're related to personal issues. And um, uh, Aristotle, if you add an Aristotelian perspective, there also are social and political ramifications and influences on people that would bring about stress and depression. So they don't occur in a vacuum. Um, and so I'll talk about that a little bit also. All right, so I'm gonna share the screen here with my favorite quotes from the article, although you have, you are perfectly free to choose your own article, um, your own quotes. As a matter of fact, I prefer that you find your own. Um, I, I pick a few just in case uh, people don't come with a lot of things to discuss, or also the ones I pick sort of tie the class together so you can understand why, um, why I assigned it. So, um, the first one is on depression. And um, I know a lot of you, I mean, since coming to Lyon, so I've taught at Lyon since 1996. And the number of people, Americans, taking depression drugs since that time has really skyrocketed. I'm not quite sure what the numbers are, but I can just tell from my students. Plus, they talk about it like they're such authorities, you know, they take this and this, or they used to take that, and now they take that. And it's kind of like a lot of students know a lot of distinctions about depression drugs. Um, I think, um, well, I think there's two parts to it. There's the, what's the, what are the outside influences, right? Relationship issues. Uh, your relationships and also the spirit of the times, what's going on socially, what's normal, and then political, right? All these things are interconnected. And then for the individual, there's the physiological, right? Um, just the mind-body connection, the medical problem that you can deal with with the pill, I guess, but the spiritual problem. So in, uh, Krista Tippett wants to focus on the spiritual problem, which is the loss of faith, hope, love, the loss of a sense of meaning and purpose. So if by spiritual, it means the different ways human beings try to go beyond themselves to live for the sake of something greater than themselves. So when you lose all sense of meaning and purpose, you're, you lose your spirit, right? Your spirituality. Um, and it just, um, so the, people being interviewed are talking about 
how they lost it and how they gradually got it back. Um, okay, so the nature of the soul, a passion for life, and an inner conversation about that passion is what motivates everything we do. Mr. Newland was um, talking about that. And that goes along with listening to other people, right? So um, your inner conversation should also include a willingness to talk to other people so that they can develop a sense of passion, uh, they could regain their sense of meaning and purpose. Um, it has to combine drugs with talking, right? Talking out what's going on in your head and also putting yourself in situations where you're having different experiences and your body's responding to the physical world and also to other people in ways that are gonna be able to snap you out of it or lead you out of it to a better place. Um, so ancient philosophy doesn't split mind and body. This is getting to be an old theme, but every single interview, uh, people have to realize these truths all over again, um, quite a bit because they didn't get it in college. They were never exposed to the material in this class. And so they end up finding out way later, right? They, they, what they got in college was just training the intellectual virtues. And then the moral, social, political, they might've had friends or not, but they might've developed those things, but not in the context of uh, school and not in an integrated way, so that you could see how it all fits together. Um, that's why a resident space liberal arts school, I mean, it has a good philosophy and it's organized to try and um, activate your soul, but we can't make you do it. And um, most classes don't even tell you what's going on. So I, that's my job just to tell you. Um, Augustine labeled depression a disease of the soul, and it's your problem, you're guilty, um, it's your fault, right? So that was before we developed a better understanding of life and psychology. Now, Mr. Um, Andrew, one of the people being interviewed, had a Jewish upbringing that was harsh, but um, he found that comforting, okay? When he got depressed, he found that uh, rigid Jewish background comforting. Now, Mr. Newland also got depressed and he was also raised in a rigid Jewish background, but he threw it all off and he rejected it. And he came to this conclusion, the biology of the spirit. Um, so Andrew Solomon, I think his name was, um, had the opposite reaction. So when you're raising children, you know, some will respond to one form of child raising better than another. If some of you were raised in a pretty rigid Household, perhaps some of your siblings responded to it differently than you did, but everybody can talk about that and they can say it's all relative, but it's not. When we talk about it, you could, parents could figure out, is this uh, a very good way to raise this kid or should we approach this child differently? How do we aim for the child to flourish as an adult? Whatever it takes. It's not moral relativism. There is a clear mark to hit, but how you get there varies a lot. Um, our capacity for love is also tied to our fear of loss. So, um, we love people because we depend on them. And so then if they hurt us, 
you know, we're, we're hurt and you can, that can lead to depression. Um, so if, for example, some love relationship, and that doesn't mean romantic love, can mean parental love, friendships, um, it can, it can, if you lose that, then you can get depressed. And people can get um, afraid of intimacy. And intimacy, again, doesn't mean sex. It means close friendships. So if you get burned by a friend, right, you might hesitate to bond with other people. And if you are living in such an isolated life, you get depressed because you need people. Um, so you lack stimulation, you feel disconnected from life. So one result of depression is that you learn how to appreciate the fact that we need other people and also trying to be a conscientious friend. Um, Parker Palmer, um, he talks about his own depression he had tried to live out, you know, the good life. And, but he noticed that every religion includes this walking in the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, there's a dark side to life. And if you realize, you know, that life has brought you to the dark side, uh, you can be patient. You can know this has happened to other people. You're not all alone. Um, but then you can work your way out of it. It would help to have a therapist, someone to talk to, who actually has a lot of experience, has listened to people um, talk about what's bothering them. The th last therapists don't judge, right? They don't, they listen. <laughs> I mean, it is interesting because before there were professionals, People just had to find somebody. It was called a friend who would just listen to them and support them through thick and thin. Uh, and then the third one was um, a woman who, uh, whose relationship to her mother sort of threw her into depression. And she understands, right, that poetry, there's a lot of poetry and literature in every culture about this. Um, so all three of these authors understand that they're not alone in their depression. And um, a lot of the world's religions have tried to help people cope, first of all, by with literature, with poetry, um, with meditation techniques, uh, just acknowledging the dark side, just like Mr. Newland said, if people just listen to each other and they acknowledge each other and respect each other, a lot of these neurotic behaviors will go away. Well, depressive behaviors will become less severe now, you can take drugs, and that's fine, but that has to be supplemented with a different attitude toward life. Um, okay, so the things we might discuss in class are you connect the articles in Tippett, all four of them, with his view of the soul, uh, and then the relation between science and religion. So depression is a, a religious crisis. It's not just a physiological crisis. And by religion, it means a sense of meaning and purpose. So there are humanists, atheist agnostic humanists. And you can say that it, if they lose their sense of purpose, it's a spiritual crisis. They just call this in the article, they focus on religion. Um, Right, and then the next question for you is to think about how your upbringing and specifically your religious upbringing has affected your adult life. 
Um, and so we might want to talk about that. It's up to the students which things they want to pick out of the articles. Um, and then the one on stress. I know that students experience a lot of stress. And during COVID, it got a lot worse for them. But you still have to get up and you still have to do what you have to do. And um, the news is that psychologists thought it would be a lot worse than it actually is. Uh, at least the article I read said psychologists are surprised that um, people's overall happiness hasn't, I mean, it dipped for a while, but it's actually gone back to pretty much what it was before COVID. Um, and then you ask why, you might ask why. Is that because people have bonded with friends? Um, they've reassessed their lives, they've reprioritized their values, um, whatever. It, you know, the research doesn't say why, it just says whether, you know, how people responded to a survey that asked them if they seemed happy or satisfied with their lives, which is, I have a problem with that because I think why is a really important question. Um, but it's social sciences don't, I mean, they try to avoid the question for a lot of stuff, reasons. Um, so Esther Sternberg was an atheist scientist. And what she realized was that her intellectual training cut her off from her emotions. And today, nowadays, we know that you can't do that, right? that the way we actually function physiologically is that there's this huge feedback loop. They're intimately connected. Um, there is a positive, there is such a, there is a human stress response. It's physiological. It protects you from danger, but when it's prolonged and um, when it's prolonged, when you just have that stress reaction all the time, your immune system gets overstimulated or suppressed and you really can't function physiologically and you get sick. So, um, so science took us away from, I have a typo there, the ancient intuition about the mind, brain, body connection. And now science is bringing us back. So, um, the stress response is might contribute to rheumatoid arthritis and depression. I think um, it's been confirmed that it's tied to rheumatoid arthritis. She, so she had her own personal experience with this. She'd been working on an article and her mother got sick and she was driving herself crazy. And then she broke down, right? Her body chemistry is got too much of her and she went to Crete. <laughs> um, I am a scholar, right? Greek philosophy scholar, but I didn't pay these people to say this stuff. I really, I just picked up the book and I like Einstein's view of God and I started reading the um, articles and lo and behold, they connect to the section that I taught about Greece. Uh, so in Crete, Asclepius is the god of healing, the son of Apollo. Apollo is the god of reason. But definitely Greek culture integrates mind and body. And I, you know, I've written extensively on that, how they do it, and why it's still important. Um, uh, Sternberg also had a Jewish Orthodox uh, background. She talks about splitting mind and body um, that happened in the modern world. I think, I think the great sin of modernity is they really thought we could exploit natural resources forever. 
And so we split ourselves off from a natural connection. So in the Greeks, it's natural for us to observe the patterns in nature, right? So we're observing the ecosphere and the biosphere and appreciating them and appreciating our place in the evolution of the ecosphere and the biosphere and doing what we can do to keep it, keep it flourishing, right? We're part of this huge system of life on earth and we need to stay in sync with it. But the modern world detached us and we're supposed to look at nature as silly putty. We gain knowledge of nature for the purpose of gaining power over nature. And that has come back to haunt us big, big time. Um, so that that's been going on for centuries. Um, then she goes into brain research and she explains how literally, right? There's a <coughs> source of anxiety and fear. This is where Aristotle talks about, remember the two main virtues? are temperance and courage because they're tied to the two emotions we share with the animals. So now, you know, Sternberg talks about the part of the brain that's connected to this. Um, she, uh, Sternberg realizes that this is an international phenomenon and it goes back for centuries, millennia. Um, change triggers the stress response. I do think you should worry about your cell phones because they are designed to trigger a stress response. Um, that's, you know, and that's how I give them so much attention. So I really think you should, you should be a lot more deliberate about it just because companies are making money off of getting you to go on your phone. So of course they're gonna trigger the most primitive kind of response. They can, the closest to the brainstem, but of course that's gonna mess with your mind. So Aristotle's whole thing about strength of mind, not overreacting. Well, when you go onto your phone, or you go onto your social media, and you keep overreacting all the time because you keep having that stress response, you're just not gonna have resilience. You're not going to be able to flourish. Um, uh, okay, people need to become more self-consciously aware. And she says you use medicine, but you also have to take care of yourself and you have to develop a healthier, conversation with yourself um, and she advocates poetry she advocates the arts right um, which is those are educating your intuition is by um, playing music about emotions various emotions um, Greek mythology is related it tells in a mythological story the, what the medical profession will tell you in a very dry version, right? So Apollos, the god of reason, is also has a child, which, which medicine is the child of science. And then from there, Hygieia, they have a daughter whose name is Health. And panacea, you know, the panacea means uh, being able to look um, like a panorama, look all around. And um, so those are the psychological qualities. So mind and body, Asclepius healing heals your soul, your whole soul, which is your mind and your body. Um, so she talks about her father had lived in a concentration camp and he just liked, he just appreciated listening to the sound of peace. He never took it for granted. Um, 
So my father lived through some pretty traumatic experiences, especially in the war. He got torpedoed a few times on his boat and he was in a lifeboat and they never knew if they were going to live or die. Uh, so by the time he was my dad, he never complained about anything and he was never, he never was under any stress, right? Because nothing was that important. He knew he'd been in these life-threatening situations enough to know that nothing that we experienced while I was growing up was going was anything like that. So the trouble with that is when your parents are never stressed at all, is that when when you grow up and you start having these situations that are difficult. You have no idea, you know, sort of how to handle it. And uh, you kind of blame yourself for feeling stressed. Like it must be my fault because my parents were able to handle this so well, uh, which, you know, that's not true either. Um, so learning how to just deal with life and not overreact, not underreact. And the stress reaction is appropriate in moderation. But when it starts to feed on itself, then you're in trouble. Um, so you need to rest, get, have friendships, support you, healthy diet and exercise, right? Um, adults bring with them strengths and weaknesses that make them weaker or stronger. So again, Aristotle's model of how to raise a kid in theory, should make them strong. But, and then they have life experiences. They would be able to respond to those better if they'd been well raised to take pleasure in acting nobly. Um, and there are these other, all these therapies are designed just to help you become more conscious of what it takes to heal, but eventually you have to use your mind to keep yourself healthy. Um, okay. Oh yeah, there's the Buddhist monks. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that Buddhist meditation is really good for your brain and for preventing stress and for keeping you um, even keel so that you change how your immune immune system works you exercise i myself ran for 42 years and i know there were times in my life when running was a good thing because my thoughts would have just really plummeted onto myself i would have had you know repetitive thinking a lot worse than i did i just had to get my body out there and i had to run for, I don't know, three, four or five miles. And that helped a lot because it changed <laughs> the body chemistry. Um, ever since 9-11, we've had to handle stress more. So what I want you to think about, how does our political, how do our political campaigns, how do they expose the fact that Americans are now under more stress? And how are they reacting to that stress? Um, anger is a secondary emotion, a response to fear. Or how do politicians tap into anger? Is that the best way to deal with problems? Uh, if we were to stand back and stop the stress response and think about political life once again, what would, be, what would be, we be looking for in a candidate, right? You don't want to react emotionally. Um, and you have to be reasonable, right? What can you expect? And what can you expect from a political speech, right? Should it appeal to fantasies, phobias? Should they try to just treat you like a rational being? For the last 50 years when I've uh, followed politics, it seems to me American people want to be entertained or they want, they want emotions to be stoked, can be 
pleasure or fear mostly. And they want emotional appeals. And when a presidential candidate isn't emotional, they just, oh, he's too wooden. You know, they don't talk about his policies, whether he's going to create a middle class or whatever it is you want in a politician. It's all about emotions and how, you know, if the person seems wooden and too unemotional, or if the person makes me feel good, I mean, it's like, that's nothing. They're going to decide who we go to war with or not, whether we take care of climate change or not, whether we have a middle class or not. Like, why do you care about their haircut? Uh, I, it's just too much for me, you know? I cannot believe how unable and unwilling Americans are to think about themselves as citizens and to think about political life. So I do have some papers. Oh, suffering, okay. We will talk about the different kinds of suffering um, because depression brings with it kinds of suffering. There's physical suffering. Oh, and I'll cover this more in class, I think, because you will have already presented three times on these three articles, revenge, uh, stress, and depression. And then I'll, if we get to it, I will cover this. You can look it over. Um, and this is just, oh, that's Newland, all right. So it's a re review. I have all four of them on here. And um, yes, I want to read some student papers that I think are interesting. And I want you to think about what's the relationship between personal stress, personal depression, and social and political life. And you have to be careful as a fellow citizen at political leader and any sort of um, leadership position that you um, that you manage people, you exercise power in a way that doesn't trigger a stress response. Because if you get people unnecessarily stressed, they will have a hard time relating to each other. The whole society, again, the social fabric will come unraveled. So let me read a little bit from some of my students' papers just to make this point, and then I'm gonna let you go. Um, the connection of our current political climate and stress and depression is outstanding. If one happens to be in a minority group, such as a Muslim or a member of the LGBTQ, plus community, uh, you're a part of a group that is seen as evil within politics, that will eventually have a toll on your stress levels and emotional state. Yes, I would think so. <laughs> um, yeah, that non-binary people have much higher suicide rates. Um, okay, so she says, particularly since September 11th, the sentiments toward people that even appear to be a member of a Muslim community is that of disgust and contempt. In this book she wrote, Scapegoats, published in 2016, this author recounts an incident during the 2016 presidential election campaigns. Quote, following the November 2015 Paris terror attacks, Ben Carson, who was running for president, compared Muslims to rabid dogs and suggested if there's a rabid dog running around in your neighborhood, you're probably not going to assume something good about that dog. Carson did not have to spell out what people do with rabid dogs, unquote. So I will note that Ben Carson was not only a presidential nominee, or candidate, 
He also was appointed to House and Human Services by a president. Like I said, I care about these agencies and the cabinet. And he, so he was in charge of whether poor people would get housing grants so they could get um, decent housing or so they could fix up their houses. Um, he himself grew up in a housing project and he was able to get out. He ended up being a brain surgeon and he lived in a $4.6 million house in Los Angeles. Um, and so he was cutting the money for um, small loans, right? 2,000, 3,000 bucks for poor people to get, you know, fix up their houses or just be able to bring themselves up a little bit. Um, I mean, my view is that it lacks empathy because, yeah, I mean, he grew up in a project, but he had a mother who kept track of him. Not every kid in a project has that. Then he was obviously a brilliant little student. And so, you know, in grade school, if you get your strokes from school, if you're really smart, well, yeah. I mean, you get all your strokes at school, you're gonna spend your time in school, you're gonna study. Not everybody is smart enough to grow up to be a brain surgeon. And so for him to cut funding for housing, housing projects, because he could say, well, I got myself out of there and the project was toxic and there was a lot of bad stuff going on. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, unless you're gonna build everybody a house in the burbs and let minority people live in the burbs, um, you know, <laughs> you don't have a solution to the problem. So yeah, I don't, I don't like that when rich people get put in charge of programs that are designed to help the poor move into the middle class. I don't like that. If you like it, vote for it. If you don't, don't. <laughs> if that's not a criteria for you and you vote in a, for different reasons, go ahead, vote for different reasons. But I just wish people would know a little bit more. Um, all right, so Carson, talks about rabid dogs, right? He compares Muslims to rabid dogs. And then the student says, this is not an uncommon sentiment among the American people. My grandmother goes to the farmer's market and I will often go with her during the summer when I'm not in school. One day, a woman wearing a head covering walked by our booth. My grandmother said something along the lines of, how much you want to bet she's about to pull a gun out and shoot us all? This she said in a completely serious manner. And her opinion on Muslims has not gotten any better. If anything, it's gotten worse. Um, and that was hard on this girl because she said it makes her depressed and stressed, right? Not the Muslim woman, but her, her grandparents' attitudes toward the Muslim woman. Uh, made her depressed and stressed. Another one, the 26th campaign of Mr. Trump uh, relied on hate speech. His way of inflaming exacerbated the hatred and fear that already existed in much of the American populace. After 2016 election, rates for hate crime went up. Uh, this is because the election of someone into such high office whose campaign relied so heavily on inflaming people's hatred against minority groups caused people with the same beliefs and sentiments to think, if he can do it and get elected, it must be okay. Um, then she says, I've always seen, some, seen very demeaning ideals and sentiments about people that are of another race, religion, or some general form of other but it seems to have gotten worse in the last three years or so. Okay, so you might disagree that Donald Trump relied on hate speech, that's fine. You can disagree. I mean, we can get data, but that's okay. I mean, normally I don't read that paragraph when I'm thinking about it. I read the next paragraph. She said, while driving in the car with some of my family, 
My grandfather once said, you know, if Hitler had won, we wouldn't be having to deal with all these Muslims and homosexuals. The rest of the people that were in the car all laughed and agreed. And if the things we say, even in a private, don't have an, an effect on those we speak about and how we act toward those people, as if that's true. And so, of course, the girl writing it thought it does have an effect. People like to believe that politics has no effect on people on an individual level, but it does. Politics is what creates laws, the standards for which our country functions. Many people believe that changing a law won't change anything about society. In some ways that's true, but in the long term, that's how society changes itself by holding itself accountable for its own actions. If it becomes legal for people the same sex to get married, eventually society accepts it. If the United States decides to declare Christianity as its primary religion, other religions will eventually become even less socially acceptable and one day may even be outlawed. So there's that. Um, uh, okay, then she says, I can definitely say that about a quarter to a half of the people I know openly claim that Christianity is superior and all others are wrong and inherently evil. So of course, those people want all other religions to be eradicated. Um, and that's just the people that are open about their belief, which not all are. And the people to be truly fearful um, of are those that aren't open about their hatred, right? Whether one believes it or not, okay. Although, okay, let's see if a quarter to half the people around you is very open about their hatred of you and you know if there are that many that are so open about it, there are plenty that are not. You become fearful, fearful for everything that you are. This fear will become a major, major source of stress for you. And even if you try to block it out, it'll eventually show itself. This can all easily cause depression to a higher degree. Um, okay, so she just connects the political to the personal. Then I had another student that said, um, she quotes from Esther Sternberg, but we all live in a fearful world, which for Americans is a relatively new thing. It used to be all over there since 9-11, it's come here. The fear has seeped into the lives of every American. People are afraid and they want solutions. My grandmother doesn't leave her home without her pistol because she doesn't want to become a victim. She was diagnosed with panic disorder and generalized anxiety disorder about five years ago, even though her symptoms began much earlier. I personally become very anxious when I'm in public places because of the terroristic acts that have occurred recently. I've been diagnosed with panic and anxiety disorder. Uh, my parents' generation is passing down the distrust and fear of the unknown to their children. Um, my cousin is eight years old. She's scared to go to the movies because she's heard her parents talk about the movie theater massacre in Colorado. Our minds are slowly becoming trained to expect the worst of our fellow citizens and the effects on our psyche are being seen by more instances of anxiety and depression. Um, people want to combat these increases in stress levels by finding solution through political changes. Um, the problem is that liberals and conservatives have different ideas of what to do to fix the problems we now face. And that's true. I mean, that's, they just have different ideas of what the problems are and how to fix the problems. Um, to some extent, they might even agree on what the problems are, but not on how to fix them. So that's, that's a more for us to think about is how, what we think of as just a personal problem, stress, depression, is really also political and social. And so Aristotle had a major 
issue, he said, if you want to have culture or civilization at all, if you want to have higher levels where people have a free mind that can engage in artistic creativity, in scientific inquiry, all that wonderful stuff, free speech, then they have to have basic trust and goodwill. So they have to be trustworthy and they have to care about each other. They have to want each other's well-being. So it's these student papers are saying that a lot of people don't trust their neighbors or anybody they don't know. They don't trust fellow Americans and they don't have goodwill for them. They don't really want them to flourish. They resent that if they flourish. You can't have a democracy unless people have trust and goodwill and they are trustworthy. Um, so it's all a matter of degree. It's just that that unravels the social fabric. So that causes more personal stress, right? So the stress tends to cause you to want to find someone to blame. You know, back in the good old days, you didn't feel that because we didn't have these so-and-sos here or whatever. Um, so the um, personal stress leads to lack of goodwill and trust, which leads to more stress, right? So you have a downward spiral. So your generation, um, I know that you've already said, you know, we need to be able to recognize complexity and we need to be able to have dialogue. And I think the students in this class really are committed to that. And it's exciting, right? It didn't take too many days to figure out that, yeah, we have a lot of engaged citizens, uh, uh, students. And then, um, and then the question is for you, you know, is how to link all this stuff together and figure out how are you going to create a society where there's less stress and depression and you avoid this downward spiral.